The Free Speech Podcast is an initiative of SFLC.in under the Free Speech Project to understand the changing landscape of free speech in an internet-enabled world. We have spoken to a host of journalists, activists, lawyers, and scholars to understand and rethink our current landscape around free speech in India. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Free Speech Podcast conducted by Software Freedom Law Center, India. Today we have uh, our founders with us. Uh, there is Mishi. Mishi is a technology lawyer and founder of SFLC.in. She is a digital liberties activist working in the United States and India. And she's currently the legal director of SFLC New York. Uh, then we have Prashant with us. Prashant is the legal director of, Software, uh, of SFLC India. He has appeared in many landmark cases before various courts in India and has deposed before the parliamentary committees on issues related to IT Act and net neutrality. We are very glad to uh, you know, have you both and we are very excited to uh, hear from you uh, what you think about the state, about the state of free speech in India. We have, so the reason why we are hosting this podcast is because we believe that there needs to be an entire reimagination, if not a complete rethink on free speech laws in India. And we believe that this podcast is going to be uh, helpful. Uh, so my first question to you is that, you know, do you think that we need a very urgent rethink of free speech laws in India? If yes, what will be the ideal process to follow it? And who should be the stakeholders in this process? Uh, Mishri, I would like to go to you first and then uh, Prashant, uh, you can take over. Sure. Thank you for having me here. And uh, I, I think it's touching um, the hope you express, which comes from uh, the naivete as well as uh, optimism only of the youth. Uh, I think we've done it so far along that perhaps we have more cynicism. Uh, but considering that you think that the podcast is going to help for a rethink of um, entire jurisprudence, I'm very touched about that. And I hope it does. Um, uh, I just would think is that um, um, I, it's, it's mostly about why we wanted to do this is because without the free speech right, my view always has been um, all other fundamental rights, like the right to vote, right to assembly, would just wither and die. And if one doesn't protect that, then what exactly is there to protect? Um, I think it's also about if you have a voice, it can be used for various purposes. And if it is used to get others' voice out as well, um, we would think that our work is done here. Those with unpopular political ideas um, have always borne the brunt of government repression. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world, we are watching it right now as it plays out in the geopolitics as well, that saying your own truth, especially in the age of disinformation and misinformation, is a big challenge here. Um, you asked about whether uh, we need a rethink of these laws in India, an entire rethink. I think um, the case which we did, Prashant and I together, Shura Singhal um, versus Union of India, in which uh, the Supreme Court said that when it comes to democracy, uh, liberty of thought and expression is a cardinal value that is paramount uh, significance under our constitutional scheme. Unfortunately, um, a lot of our Supreme Court judgments um, just stay that, great judgments because um, everything does not travel and trickle down to the police station. And I'm sure that you've already covered and I don't want to um, re repeat what uh, your listeners or viewers may already have heard many a times about this judgment, very interesting one, Kedarnath. The Supreme Court keeps saying that we've already told you how to tackle sedition cases and um, uh, the political masters of our country as well as the police keeps telling them that uh, we don't know what you're talking about. We're just going to put people behind jail um, and make their life completely miserable, uh, even if many of those people would be acquitted at the end of the process. But we're going to make their life miserable just because they either raised the slogan or said something which they don't like. 
increasingly we are also seeing that the state of Uttar Pradesh thinks that uh, criticizing either the chief minister or the prime minister is also seditious. So um, I uh, uh, sometimes get obviously a little uh, cynical because that's uh, what I see. I've seen that there are 60 plus books which have been banned in India since the 1950s, which is coming from your tracker, the information itself. Um, more than 23,000 websites have been blocked in India. Um, but um, uh, why I also feel is that the path to freedom is always long and arduous. Um, you did say my other um, country which I uh, live in, uh, practice law in, is the United States, and uh, which does have um, the most speech protective country uh, laws in the world, which is also facing a lot of challenges now. Um, things which have been established law are being challenged like um, um, Sarah Palin challenging New York Times here. Uh, so um, I would say that this country also took almost 200 years to establish firm constitutional limit, so limits on the government's power to punish um, seditious or um, subversive speech. And uh, many people had to suffer along the way. Um, people who were burning flags in uh, 1969 in Harlem or uh, people who were talking and addressing a rally of peaceful workers um, uh, against slavery, all of them had to suffer. And if it took them that long, then uh, we are a relatively young country in many ways, uh, with much younger uh, people all the time uh, trying to push against the boundaries, despite the fact uh, that the geriatric leaders are not ready to let them express themselves fully. So if we have a voice, we will express it. And um, and I think if laws don't keep up with it, um, then perhaps um, the facts on the ground would be made such um, that uh, India will, have, will suffer economically as well as politically if the laws are not catered to the modern world we live in. Thank you, Mishi. I think that's quite insightful. Uh, Prashant, what do you have to say about this? Thanks, Thanks Radhika, for the introduction. Uh, yeah. Mishi has already addressed the issue. Definitely, we have a lot of issue and a lot of baggage from the, uh, let's say, the colonial laws. But it's not just restricted to colonial laws like sedition and criminal defamation. We also have a major problem with the way these laws are implemented the way even where the supreme court has made the laws clear how these laws is implemented in immigration yes it's a time for us to take a relook at some of these laws uh, and while some of these laws are used with impunity against persons who have a point of view different from that of the john minority that is the major issue so if we cannot protect persons who have a different point of view who have, who uh, that which may be quite different from the popular view, uh, view and this could, could be unpopular among the masses or among the, let's say the section which identifies themselves with the government point of view. I think that uh, is a major issue and that is where we need to look at maybe rephrasing these laws, uh, challenging them before the, uh, let's say the uh, various courts, etc. We have seen this happening over a period of time. For example, when the Information Technology Act was amended and when Section 66A was introduced, uh, we slowly saw a lot of cases being reported across India, uh, from right from Mumbai to Kolkata, uh, persons being arrested for sharing of uh, sharing a cartoon, uh, persons being arrested for liking a Facebook post. So, and that is when finally the matter came before the Supreme Court, Shreya Singhal judgment, which Mishi mentioned. But even with all that, even with the judgment in place, we found that uh, police stations, uh, police officers across the country are still using Section 66A against people. So what do we do in such cases? Well, even after there is a judgment by the apex court of the country, we have the laws being, there's laws which are struck off the book being used by the police force. So it's not just about the laws always, yes, there are some, for example, like uh, criminal defamation and sedition, which needs to be changed. But also, there needs to be a better communication and better awareness creation. That is where the initiatives like the free speech tracker by SFNC is very useful, where 
you can make people aware of what is happening what is happening with various book bets, what is happening with the various uh, judgments which the Supreme Court has come up with and how it is being enforced in the country, the kind of websites which are being banned in the country. So yes, there definitely is a need for, uh, let's say, laws to be changed. And uh, of course, when you talk about stakeholders, it's not just the parliamentarians. We need to get all people involved in this, uh, the lawyers, the civil society, the students, uh, journalists, the entire section of society, people who are affected by this. Yes, as she said, free speech right is paramount to ensure that we exist and prosper as a democracy. We are in a difficult situation because uh, the, these rights are being curtailed. Uh, I mean, instead of situation improving, we are seeing that over the years, we just talked about how US improved over the years. We are now seeing situation where Things are getting worse over the years. That definitely is not something which is promising. That definitely initiatives like your free speech tracker can go a long way, at least in raising the awareness. That's a very interesting point that you made, Prashant, that you know, we're seeing it becoming worse. If any of us open social media at any point of time, a cursory glance at it, you know, shows that uh, the world is burning and free speech is dying. You know, even like I think one thing that trolls and activists and like everybody on, uh, I would say Twitter agree on is that there is no free speech, right? Do you think it's true that, you know, like, uh, because it's so, I mean, that, 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 you know, the way that we see on social media that free speech is dead. When you open it, you feel that free speech is dead. You think that uh, after social media, after social media has come into the world, that free speech has become like the right to free speech is dwindling. And how did we reach here like this rapidly that now that we feel everything is dead? Uh, Prashant, I would like to you to go first and then Mishi, you can take over. Uh, Radhika, we have seen that the social media platforms have given voice to a lot of persons who would not have been heard otherwise. We have seen women being, let's say, uh, spearheaded by persons on social media. A lot of changes happening across various countries thanks to social media. But that was the initial phase when governments were not very clear about what to do with this uh, new thing called the internet. But subsequently, they found, okay, it's uh, I mean, as far as the internet is concerned, it's often easier to control if you control these key players, the key players called intermediaries. So you control a few, a few players on the internet and you can often control the media. Earlier it was about controlling a few news media outlets, now it is about controlling these intermediaries. So it, uh, although we saw an explosion of, uh, let's say, free speech um, over these various platforms, various uh, social media platforms as such, but suddenly you find that governments have also found a way to control these platforms, control these narratives. So yes, it's not uh, often a rosy scene with the, let's say, the social media platforms. There have been a lot of, uh, let's say, regulation by uh, the various governments. You have seen new and new regulations coming up across the world. And uh, one country, I mean, let's say, we have seen a lot in South Asian countries, mostly in, with India leading, and that, those regulations being copied by other countries like, let's say, Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc. So, uh, although uh, I mean, there was, let's say, a lot of expression on these platforms earlier, and these platforms leading to, uh, let's say, uh, democracy uh, in flourishing in various parts, but that same platform has uh, seen now a lot of, uh, let's say, regulation, and there's also a lot of hate speech where uh, let's say this good speech gets countered often by hate speech and the uh, speech which uh, is important for democracy, which is important for people to express themselves. That speech being countered by hate speech and uh, I mean there being often no avenues to restrict this kind of uh, hate speech on these platforms. Right. Mishi, do you think that uh, freedom of speech and expression is dying a quick and sudden death? Well, I hope not. And um, um, I think there's a little bit of um, division. I'm going to make a, 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 um, 
the way we've traditionally understood free speech and expression and right to free speech and expression is something which is again enforceable against state actors so there is a government and uh, it has a lot of power it has the police it has everybody else and it uses that power to manage information who says what what people um, watch what kind of information they receive in we are talking today in the midst of a crisis like the world um, thought that we were beyond but uh, we've seen an aggressive country now challenging the sovereignty of another country and the Russians watching um, a completely different reality in their um, part of the world on television, on the internet and various ways. If they don't have access to independent resources, then the Russian government has created a parallel in a way that um, uh, their, their information is completely different from what reality is on the ground. So one is always the state, what it shows and what it controls and how it uses its state machinery to punish people for expression of certain ideas. And history teaches us that the first target of government repression is never the last target. If we do not come to the defense of free speech rights of the most unpopular among us, and even if their views are antithetical to the very freedom um, free speech star stands for then no one's liberty is secure the second part is this proxy um thing about um, um because social media prashant rightly said that gave voices to the unvoiced and if i have a voice i should be allowed to use it but that also meant that everybody the chatter of the street is now uh, for everyone's consumption online and people have confused a bunch of things. People have confused um, the right to free speech to say, to mean that they can say whatever they want, to harass people, to express themselves in words which people uh, one to one in person may not actually use, uh, no matter how much hatred they have for each other, which has also amplified a lot of hatred in the world. Now, whether that is free speech and expression, um, uh, is is usually misunderstood to be the same right when it's not. This is people just talking and nobody has a right to free speech to harass me or say things to me or talk to me. I'm not a state and I have no obligation to listen to any kind of things which people want to say. And the third thing which I would say is that uh, the um, which used to be heckler's veto or the crowd censoring which has now led to something um, I'm going to say, which is not very popular, is the cancel culture, because that also has various interpretations. Now, um, uh, some of it is very well deserved because there have been people in power who have been occupying places in power and then using that power to really um, uh, against minorities, against people who deserve the same rights as anyone else does. Um, however, we have become such sticklers to what is said, uh, to words, um, that we just don't want to even look at those words in any context. And uh, we don't want to give people a right uh, to be forgiven, to reinvent themselves. Um, I made a lot of mistakes when I was young, when I was in college. Um, I, uh, I think the most education I got was in the debating teams, in the moot courts, around the canteens, uh, fighting with my friends, standing for all the wrong ideas. And um, I actually feel that perhaps that's a good thing that that time friends of mine were not making a video or um, I was not making a video of other friends if their po opinions were popular, uh, unpopular, I would say. Uh, so I, I would say that it's also, when you look at social media, there are so much of conflation of issues and um, idea that if I stop somebody or somebody's content is taken down by the platform, all of these are free speech rights, which they're actually not. Um, there's a way to talk, there's a way to discuss, um, and um, it must follow the boundaries of just basic social interaction and etiquettes. Uh, which many of the people who are rightly called as trolls cross. 
there are politically motivated trolls who want to just drown certain voices and uh, the, which who indulge in online harassment as a form of censorship so i will say that as there has been amplification of more voices in speech online there also has been censorship but to call it all a first amendment uh, uh, for free speech which is 191a in our constitution or uh, first amendment in the us uh, issue i think that's stretching it a little too much or perhaps conflating a bunch of ideas because um, we all like simplicity but uh, hard things are hard and so is this um i i i do see that um, uh, because everybody gets to speak uh, there will be popular as well as unpopular ideas both on rights as well um but to answer your initial question i don't think that it's dead it looks like that um the world is burning for sure um for a variety of reasons um uh, and um, sometimes it seems that this seem these free speech rights may be perhaps a small thing in comparison to the larger issues we are facing but then as i earlier said in fact without this right everything else wither withers away because even people who try to bring attention to the larger issues use the same platforms to express themselves right as you said that there are no uh, you know no easy solution it's a hard problem uh, the next question is my favorite and uh, you know i ask this to all of our guests uh, the next question is do you think that free speech rights in an internet enabled world need to be absolute like the first amendment or do we still need reasonable restrictions mushi uh, please go first then we let it move to prashant well you're talking to the wrong person um i have always liked um uh, to be on the extreme of uh, free speech and i would say that uh, i've had the benefit of going back and forth between two societies ones where first amendment actually protects all uh, the various things with very few exceptions and uh, another one where the first amendment just created exceptions which is in india and um, um and i have seen how whether it is about innovation or it is about um, uh, just the expression of who people are how it thrives in this society but you cleverly put a uh, a, a nice um, a limitation to your question because in the age of internet i also think that in the age of internet what has happened is that we try to think that oh so many of the unpopular beliefs are being now amplified and look every society is bursting at its seams and everybody's fighting and everyone wants to um go against each other and there's so much hatred in the world it must be the internet well yeah it is the internet but it is the centralized form of the internet where the companies only wanted eyeballs and they wanted more and more engagement and it is true that um, the way primates are built a lot of some negative stuff did get amplified much more than the actual um uh, stuff uh, whether it is truth or certain other kind of balanced views um i remember very early on when we started doing this work 7 8 years ago there was a it was very popular amongst the free speech activists and i'm not a full time activist uh, so um and but to say it um, uh, amongst a lot of people who work in this space oh that um, uh, more speech will drown bad speech so it will be the marketplace kind of um, ideas and i never believed in that system at all it was good to say it looked good because there were no other solution but i thought it was nonsense because even the courts don't believe in that system the us court doesn't believe because everything requires systems and structures um, even the courts not everybody can go and argue and say whatever they want there is a decorum there's a way some only parties come they express themselves so i um i will say that um, uh, i think it would be wrong to think about um uh, this in terms of censoring hate speech uh, because it runs counter to the long term interests of the most frequent victims of hate 
who are racial, ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities. Um, I don't think that because right now um, the, the centralized platforms, the gatekeepers of the internet have not done their jobs or they have done the jobs of actually ruining uh, the entire other rights, which is uh, robbing us off of our rights of privacy and only and only concentrating on more eyeballs. Um, that should tell us that that's the only internet which can exist. Um, and because we don't like them right now, uh, we give the power to the governments uh, to decide which opinions are hateful. Uh, because history has taught us that government is more apt to use this power to prosecute minorities than to protect them. Um, and I know that uh, uh, the best protection we have against any Nazi type regime in any country um, is exactly tolerating hateful speech. Um, having said that, um, I do think that the current form of the internet is not conducive to anything which we are seeing right now. And uh, the gatekeepers have to change, their practices have to change. The platforms will be regulated as is now happening. It is, um, uh, it's just the way of the world. Everything has to burn before the powerful people pay any attention. Um, that's why uh, when we've been saying this for 10, 12 years, nobody cared. And now when uh, things are moving into the Western world, um, everybody is sitting up and seeing what had started to happen in the developing world or the majority world, as we should call it, where uh, we inhabit um, uh, already. So I, I think um, I still like the uh, very much I'm on the US First Amendment side of speech, uh, but I do think the, f the way Internet is structured, that needs to be changed. Yeah. I think that's very helpful. Prashanti, would you like to go next? Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, whether it's the age of the internet or otherwise, I think we uh, cannot have absolute free speech. There definitely needs to be some restriction. For example, if you look at hate speech that's been targeted at minorities, vulnerable sections, etc., we cannot have, uh, let's say, a free flow of such uh, let's, uh, hate speech targeted at various sections. Such hate speech on these platforms will also have real world consequences, like the way we have seen in Myanmar and the way we are seeing in our own country now. So, unless there is some kind of restrictions on this uh, hate speech being peddled on media, definitely it could be problematic. Uh, to give a personal example, when uh, I was in college, it was like the, I would say the pre internet era, maybe. Uh, we could often see this pamphlets being distributed by the, uh, the various, I would say, the right-wing groups, the fundamentalist groups, etc. And that was in this hush-hush taunts. I mean, you'll be, uh, you hardly get to see them in public. But now what you find is that kind of information that used to be uh, shared in a very clandestine way you know, using pamphlets, etc., is now shared on WhatsApp groups, on family WhatsApp groups, and it is accepted. So you can communicate speech, which is definitely hate speech, on these platforms without any uh, fear of repercussions, without any fear of any legal actions even sometimes. So that is problematic. So when this gets normalized, when hate speech gets normalized, definitely this is going to have real world uh, consequences. And that is something that we need to be careful about. So it's not about just uh, something on social media, something on Facebook, something on WhatsApp. This definitely will have a, a let's say, effect on uh, real world where people could be attacked, as sections of communities could be targeted. Definitely, we cannot turn a blind eye to such information, such uh, messages being posted on social media. So I believe there should be restrictions when it comes to such media. Such Who will uh, these restrictions? The government? Uh, see, again, when it came to intermediaries earlier, there were this kind of uh, pipes which would, uh, let's say, uh, transmit information from one part to another. So these were like dump pipes. Like. So I think the intermediaries, their roles have changed a lot. And like you mentioned earlier, when it is in their benefit, 
to uh, make sure that the negative speech gets uh, more attention, more eyeballs. And when it is in their interest to do that, definitely uh, it is also their obligation to have some control on such content, which could lead to, uh, as I said earlier, real world consequences. This kind of hate speech, definitely it is on the intermediates also to control, them, not just the law enforcement agency or the government. That's why I would like to work with you because we don't agree on everything. Um, um, I, I would say that um, he, he raises the right problem, but I don't think that the solution is the right solution here because um, in the context that we are talking about, I don't think that free speech uh, uh, prevents punishing conduct that intimidates, harasses or threatens anybody. Um, threatening phone calls are not constitutionally protected and even under the First Amendment, which is very wide. But I will say, um, when we say some limits have to happen, generally the job, um, uh, if, if you don't assign anybody, then nobody does that job. And when you assign that job, generally it falls on the government. And in India, at least our tendency is whatever the government is doing, the must be must have thought about certain things. Unfortunately, right now they've only thought about uh, whatever politically it works for one side. And it doesn't matter which political party is in power. Um, and if it works for their side, Mr. Sibyl had started to um, uh, saying by things which were unflattering about Gandhi family. And they had to be censored um, in the Congress regime. In the BJP regime, we see a completely different side. And it is about if you say anything about a chief minister who who's affiliated to the party or um, uh, the prime minister, that's where people want to go. And I'm not saying the people in power want to go, but now there are many proxies who would make sure that somebody suffers a very, in India, um, processes the punishment before one can get anywhere. We are seeing already, uh, even bail proceedings have become full-fledged trials, like the Delhi High Court one, which is going on for some time, uh, for a student raising slogans. So my issue becomes is that um, when we say that some limitations have to happen, that job falls mostly on the government or its agencies and the people who are given the power to do that. Um, I think my favorite thing, and this is where I find the most um, fun studying free speech and expression is um, uh, movies, as well as um, nowadays uh, things which are available on OTT platforms. In, in India, as much as we like films and film stars and everybody, we also are very quick to get offended. And uh, that's why we have a censor board instead of a central board of film certification. And you see whether it is um, a, a suitable boy, which I did not ever understand why the objection was. And when I read, I'm like, oh, hmm. the objection there is a Hindu woman is a kissing, kissing a Muslim man with a temple in the background. The Sikhs get offended because uh, oh, somebody is presented in a bad light in a certain way. Um, the Muslims get offended because a Muslim person is a, uh, represented in a bad way. Whether it is um, Leela or a Patalok or uh, uh, one of my favorite thing was that uh, lipstick under a burqa has, uh, it's, it's too feminine. There are too many women in there. And uh, uh, all of these kind of things come up. And that's when people can see how, what information they actually consume also is going to be decided by some person who has power given by the government and who have come with their own biases who can say this film is too lady oriented or too this or too that, etc. And then say that uh, uh, people are not uh, allowed to express themselves in form of art and people are not allowed to consume that in uh, because they the nanny state will decide. So I personally have a major, major issue with the entire set of laws where the government decides this is what people can do, can say, can eat, can wear, all of it. And that includes, um, uh, that includes all that is justified um, as a restriction on 191A as well. So um, uh, the only thing which I would say is that it is true that um, I would want the companies to do better in terms of takedown, in terms of um, uh, trying to 
control what kind of content actually um, is circulating and not allow them to pretend to hide behind free speech and expression as they have tried to co-opt that argument all the time to say, don't make us the arbiters of the truth, uh, but basically just make us the arbiters of uh, uh, propagating content which gets us more eyeballs and more advertising revenue. I think if we take away the power of advertising, they will stop doing that as well. So again, if these are all very complicated issues which work so much in tangent, uh, so much um, uh, they, they seem tangential sometimes, but they're working in tandem with each other. Um, you can't talk about uh, defamation or sedition or free speech and expression or internet shutdowns or how women are treated, um, uh, uh, um, all of it just in isolation with one another. And that's, a, that's I think, a perfect statement to which I can ask my next question. Um, you know, day in and day out, we have new legislations which are pouring in, which are trying to regulate speech, uh, and which I would say that go also go beyond the reasonable restrictions that are envisaged uh, by the makers of our constitution. Uh, do you think that in light of the changing times and especially of changing mediums, we need these new legislations or are we moving towards excessive legislation which will come down heavily on speech? Uh, Prashant, would you like to go first? Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's some cases where legislations are necessary, I would say. For example, when the IT Act was introduced in the year 2000, we did not have any uh, provision dealing with the offenses in the cyberspace. So definitely there was and there was also need for having legal recognitions for electronic contracts, e-commerce. So in the, those cases, we definitely need legislation. Now, uh, we're talking about the legislation on uh, the personal data protection. So there again, uh, the legislation is necessary. So it's not that we don't want any legislation whatsoever. But again, when there are restrictions on free speech being introduced, that's when we need to have this discussion. Uh, so uh, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the problem is often when uh, we have, let's say, uh, criminal offenses for most, uh, uh, when, when any new law comes up, the problem is the kind of offenses that we have in these uh, laws, as such, whether it's the IT Act or whether, again, we talk about uh, data protection, etc. The criminal offenses are often a problem. That seems to be our answer for any issue uh, that arises. So that is something that we need to be careful about. Any law that comes with new criminal offenses. We have seen that in, even with respect to takedown of content, uh, law enforcement agencies sometimes send requests to intermediaries to take down content. In fact, uh, there was a case where uh, which we handled it as a fallacy, where uh, a publication, uh, because of uh, I mean, some labor issues which uh, they were facing, uh, and this was reported by a blogger and suddenly you find a notice being sent and police landing at the place where this person was residing, asking him to take down the content. So those are issues. So it's not just about the law asset. It's also about how the law gets implemented. There's no such provision as far as the IT Act is concerned or the rules are concerned. The police, the law enforcement agencies cannot ask someone to take down content. So that is where we also need to have let's say, proper awareness and thus also make sure that there are proper mechanisms in place so that these people can reach out uh, maybe the lawyers and have this support structure in place so that there is protection so that these uh, the red their rights get protected yeah thanks right thank you prashant uh mishi do you think that we have we have excessive legislation in india right now I don't know what that means, in fact, about excessive legislation. I think I agree with Prashant that there are certain areas where either these are new issues which have come up and uh, uh, you do need some framework. What is allowed and what is not allowed? It's data protection um, is a very good example of that. Um, there are new technologies coming up. There is cryptocurrencies. You can't come up with and just say, oh, yeah, we will never have, uh, leg we'll never legalize cryptocurrencies when there is underlying technology which might be of usage and there might be certain things one can look into new businesses are being formed under that um, and the way technology develops there will be areas where there is a lot which is now 
being performed um, by software. So some of those things will have to be adapted. The laws will have to be adapted or new laws will have to come into existence. The problem happens is about certain principles. So um, um, I think Prashant already voiced about something which we all are very passionate about since we started working at SFLC. Uh, dot in is a we don't like um, burdensome regulation now uh, the burdensome regulation and i think this also comes from my experience between these two contrasting jurisdictions is that india's favorite thing is always and i think I, and i think long ago when uh, after we got independence somebody was sitting there had a template um, and there are four or five things they came up with that when citing a law read all laws and then make a mixture out of it like uh, it's always a khichdi you will see some provisions being lifted from the us law some provisions from the uk law australia canada everything and every time they give the example of dr ambedkar saying oh our fundamental rights came from such constitution our directive principles came from the other institution well the constituent assembly spent a lot of time thinking why some things were important and templates were important to them even in this case i know that templates are very useful and important to look to another jurisdiction to see what have they done and what impact it has had but what happens in our country is we do, we just keep picking up sections from various places and think that we have now picked up all the best things we would have come up with the best outcome no it doesn't happen that way because everything has a context everything has institutions countries have their culture countries have their society's way of doing certain things so that shouldn't happen the second principle i would say is that we should india must and must understand what is light handed regulation businesses cannot exist in the way we do work in india um orf just recently released a study about this large number of businessmen who have been behind bars for some smaller thing or the other because our laws are such that when some offense happens we quickly move it to jail time uh, non bailable offense jail time cognizable offense that's what you will see all around instead of saying certain things can be handled through contractual damages through tortious damages you give down damages to the person so that they can be brought to the same position as they were before the, all of this happened but that doesn't work here in india we quickly move to criminal work then we get police involved our police does not follow even the basics of uh, um, forensic collections many places they are trying to take away people's phones and their devices and not follow what even our law of evidence expects them to follow so i think we do have to move if we want to be as innovative if all these number of unicorns that are coming out and all the people want to create those businesses you cannot have laws which are so burdensome that people are left grappling with police and that's why the corruption also happens and various other things um so i think certain areas you do need laws but the regulation needs to be light handed it should be left to more arbitration more contractual stuff and um, and the enforcement has to be much stricter it is uh, shreya singhal was decided in 2015 66a is off the books even now we've seen police using that section in many parts of the country um other um organizations who work in our ecosystem had to go back to the supreme court to say look what's happening right now kedarnath kedarnath versus state of bihar is a judgment of 1962 where the supreme court talks about how 124a which is the sedition uh, laws how are they going to be used and look where we are right now uh, i think the 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 problem is about enforcement to a large extent and even when the courts do their jobs even when the lawyers do their jobs i don't think it trickles down to the police to the lower judiciary in the same way and our public education on all of these issues is abysmal we have made law like latin was in rome we 
don't we like lawyers like only for it to be restricted to all the people who have gone to fancy law schools our um, uh, even our media shows some nonsensical forms of law i i constantly look for things coming out of india hoping against hope that they will use those platforms to educate people nobody does all this bollywood drama of um, um, how police is handling stuff or how one we are relying only on one police officer's moral conscience there should be systems there should be processes which should work people should be aware of their rights and uh, also um, uh, it it has to be light handed every law does not need detailed rules and regulations to be drafted by bureaucrats and then to be enforced by them i think that's where our attitudes needs to right i think that's that's quite insightful so i have a very very tricky question for both of you and uh, this might have a difficult answer but it's a question that i think our viewers would be most interested in you know we have spoken about the problems we now have to focus on the solutions so uh if each of you can give me one solution on how do we fix the internet and make it conducive for freedom of expression without causing any harm I know it's a difficult question, but I would give you a go. Mishi, you can have the last. Uh, you can go first, and then Prashant. I think decentralization. If you want one word answer, I think decentralization is going to address a lot of our problems. I have a problem uh, now. Whether you want to call it Web 3.0 or any other new buzzword in which the VCs want to put in their money, please go ahead and do that. But I do think decentralization is really going to help. I, and i will say that if regulation has to happen it has to come in form of um, competition law in terms of actual privacy protecting people and um, um, also um, in terms of um, um, content moderation where gatekeepers like few companies are not the breadwinners and the government needs to get out of the business of free flow of information and uh, the rest is much harder but decentralization is something which as technologists we definitely can do and um, uh, and unfortunately i will say i see moronic takes from uh, a lot of people all the time there are certain tv channels and journalists who have prime time um, uh, bandwidth who i have a very hard time when i watch them defending free speech and expression but um, that's um, um, that's the hard part of uh, standing up for free speech and expression that you have to even defend them um, i think one should look at aclu when they have defended ku klux klan which is the most abhorrent thing ever and uh, how uh, and and that's what standing for free speech really means it's really aberrant ideas because um, um, but um, but there are technical solutions and there are um, framework solutions get the competition law going get the privacy laws going so that's what i would think the answers uh, would lead us to that direction right i'm sure the answer must not have been easy and it comes with years of experience um prashant do you want to go next i'm sorry i don't have a magic wand wish i had to solve the whole issues with the internet but Yeah. So what Mishi suggested definitely the way the internet was imagined initially was a, a decentralized space uh, where um, each uh, this is a computer which connected is equally powerful, and we have a change from that situation to the place where we have all these big corporations, big servers deciding what I mean, what you can say, what you cannot say in some cases. So yes, decentralization is a solution, but that won't Uh, address everything. For example, the problems with content moderation. That's going to say whether it's going to be decentralized. That's uh, and if any platform or any, uh, for example, something like a diaspora. Uh, once you have more users coming in, you will have the again the same hate speech problems. So we definitely need a robust content moderation. Uh, let's say what do you call uh, procedures over there also, in, as well as these platforms are concerned. and then yes we also need proper legal frameworks legal frameworks with want uh, 
that say put people behind bars easily. That's not what we are looking at. But uh, the regulations which would ensure that people can do business properly, people can uh, let's say talk with each other uh, without any fear of uh, being put behind bars for the uh, silliest of comments that you make. So uh, regulations where your uh, free speech rights, your privacy rights are protected. Right. I think this is this has been a very interesting conversation. And as Prashant said, there is no magic wand. But we are uh, but we are still trying to understand what the problems are facing before uh, we come down on the solutions. So thank you both of you for taking out the time. Uh, you know, I'm sure our viewers had a lot to learn and they'll continue, uh, you know, they continue to look forward to your work, to the work that SFLC is doing with its free speech tracker. And hopefully somewhere down the line, we can have a better world where free speech is more conducive. Thank you.